like saying, I just recently celebrated my 80th birthday. And when I turned 50, I thought I was probably, I'd already lived maybe half of my life. And now I'm sure. See? But being 80 and also with the COVID pandemic, it made me think about death. I think people start thinking about it earlier. Maybe when they're 60s, they realize, you know, you're getting close to that other age. Um, and I've had classmates from high school and college pass away already, as well as, of course, relatives and sometimes even a few students I've had. So you realize when you reach 80, you're pretty darn lucky. And um, to be alive, you're lucky. Survived as long as I have, I feel like. But when I was thinking about this show, I was thinking, okay, I like to draw the figure, and I have done a series in the past dealing with the plague, the AIDS pandemic, where I used the skeleton and the embrace of death as a subject matter. Many of the drawings are in that sort of reddish brown book there called Clint Brown's Drawings. If you're interested, you can look at that later. Um, by the way, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Talking through this, I'm never sure. Um, anyhow, I wanted to draw the figure, do, do some more with the figure, and also deal with this period of my life and what's going on right now in our world and our society. And I was thinking about how do you show that? How do you show the threat of death, the reality that it's something we're all going to have to face. And I decided to do this body of work, a couple different themes. Um, part of it's this embrace of the angels or demons, those mythological figures <coughs> that we assume are going to be part of, or we have a myth that it's going to be part of our passing. And <clears throat> along with that, I like the idea of being able to orchestrate the space around the figures with those wing forms. Because when you're drawing the figure, sometimes the big problem is, what do you do with that empty space? So the wings forms that you see gave me a chance to orchestrate the space, fill the space, but also in a way be more expressive there's a kind of limitation to what you can do with the body. Um, I should mention, I taught figure drawing most of my career. Um, I taught at Seattle, well, Seattle Pacific College for a couple of years, and then Oregon State University. And um, teaching figure drawing and doing it myself gave me quite an experience with the figure. All of these drawings or none of these drawings were done from models. They're drawn out of my head. I can talk a little bit about the process and the media. The media in these is charcoal and Conti crayon. The Conti originally came only in black, white, and a kind of reddish brown, but now it comes in a whole range of colors, um, every color that a regular pastel would have. It's a little harder than pastel, it works well with charcoal. You can erase it, you can cut back into it. And most of them are really more um, tonal. There is some color in the wings, and like you see in here, and in this one. This is also the Conti crayon, worked over, but more on a piece of plywood, a plywood board. Um, I'm working with value and line. And I want to talk a little bit about that. The value, when you think about value, most people think about rendering light and shadow. <coughs> they see value as a description of light and shadow. And I think even most drawing teachers talk about that. And <coughs> when you're drawing from light, that works fairly well. But if you want to make something up, 
and you don't have a model, I found that it would be, it's better to draw, use value as a modeling tool. Use it to shape and form. I think of it as pushing forms back and under. Creating some depth. Now let's see. Well, like in here, maybe I think this might be one you can see. Pushing this leg back under this forward leg, or in some of these others, like the three figures over there. Creating more depth. And instead of using value as an extension of what you see, you're using it more in terms of what you know in terms of anatomy and space. So that's what I'm doing with the value. I'm also orchestrating the media with my hand, cutting into it, um, often with an eraser, activating the space, making it more expressive. <coughs> um, the process for me is usually starting off with small sketches. Um, that's something I learned a long time ago, I guess, when I was in school, is to work something out maybe as a little sketch first. And then I sometimes would go to a large piece of newsprint to try it out on a fuller scale. And then if I think it's working, I'll go on to something bigger. So I, give, I use a sketch sort of like giving an idea an audition, testing it out, see what I like trying maybe variations on a theme. Um, the title for the pieces comes later. I think the general public has this idea you start off with a title and then you do a drawing. But no, for me I do the drawing and then about a week before this show I figure out what I'm going to call these things. So that came later. But um, just to talk about some of the particular pieces, um, these over here represent different angels, Azrael, the angel of death, and um, angel that angel of silence, angel of souls. The next three drawings down that way. Um, I didn't start off thinking about it this way, but they became a little play on that idea. Of Hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. I call it hear no more, see no more, speak no more. And um, they're pretty much just charcoal and conti crayon. Um, charcoal is a good tool because it's easy to pick back up and erase. I use an eraser as a drawing tool a lot. I cut back in um, with it, um, cut back in to make white lines on the black surface. Um, and you can kind of get that feeling there where I also taken an eraser like in this first drawing to cut down through part of it, which again activates the space, makes it um, more expressive. Um, drawing on that wall behind you that by itself is one of the earliest drawings and it's based on Greek theme or Greek myth about Persephone, who is seducted by Hades and taken into the underworld. And later, her mother and Zeus convince Hades that he should let her out every spring, sort of like a rebirth, and with spring comes new growth and flowers again. And then she would have to return to the underworld again in the fall. So that's kind of about the transition of life. <clears throat> and then um, I'll talk about these, the four horsemen here in a second. I gotta get a little drink of water. I'm getting hoarse. <clears throat> Haven't talked this much since I was teaching. Um, anyhow. There are two sets of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This one, it's not the first set I've done. I did some in the past. Um, one uh, one um, group of four horsemen is owned by the Cascade Campus up on Alberta. They bought uh, a set of these the same size, earlier one, which is represented in the book on drawings. 
<clears throat> but it's from the book of Revelations in the Bible, the original idea. Um, the four horsemen is pestilence, famine, war, and death. Here with famine, I decided to put a gluttonous perch and on top, hogging everything, and then people starving down here. On <clears throat> this one, I included the bat on the head because of the connection with COVID-19, which is <clears throat> mutated from bats, and again up here. <clears throat> so, do you have any questions at this point? Give me a chance to drink some more water. So, um, if you want to think about questions. Yeah. How many hours a day do I draw? How many hours a day do I draw? Um, well, it's kind of hard to say exactly, but generally what I like to do, especially in the winter months, I had a studio, I told me to build a fire out and I got a wood stove, I build that sometime before noon. In the morning I'm usually reading or doing some writing. And then in the afternoon I go in the studio. Working on drawings or whatever I'm working on. Sorry, Dylan, what is the question? So, how do you keep the background such like a clean white background? Oh, well, <clears throat> this is, these are gessoed. This is drawn on what are called door sims, which is a thin plywood, <clears throat> and so is this one. It's an eight inch thick plywood, and I gesso it with white gesso, that one. Some of these others, um, the ones you see on gray paper, it's actually white paper. I gessoed it with a gray um, coating. <clears throat> um, with these, most of the time I can erase, but I can also go back and add some more white paint to that white gesso. If I smear something, I can touch it up. Okay? <clears throat> and um, this piece over here, <clears throat> this is on tar paper, basically roofing paper that you put on your roof. <clears throat> Somebody asked me, is that archival? And I said, well, they put it on your roof for 30 years. And <laughs> but <clears throat> I actually first had some students do life-size paintings of figures on this stuff after I experimented. And I like the result. And I've done other earlier things on it. With acrylic. This is done with the colored candy crayon and some charcoal. And again, we have pestilence over here. Pestilence. Famine. War. And death. Um, and these, I just deliberately left these more linear or with line instead of value. Um, especially you can see it in this one, I think, most clearly. And I want to talk a little bit about why in a minute or two. But, um. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Um, on nearly all of the uh, angel figures and demon figures, the head is objectified in some way. You can recognize it and describe it. You've chosen three here. Mm -hmm. where it's extremely abstract. Was there a purpose content-wise or of me, some other yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that? these came a little later. I, I started to think maybe I was getting too illustrational. I wanted them to be more of a mystic um, power presence, not so much just a person. Um, these are metaphors. You know, symbols, metaphors. And we use metaphors to talk about things that are intangible, things that aren't physically present. 
We use symbols to represent things that aren't physically present. And to me, that figure above, that sort of half angel, and I deliberately want it to be a ambiguous, is it angel or demon? And it could be either one. And I want it to be rather ambiguous so that people can play with it in their own head a little bit. Um, but yeah, the other thing I'll say, you know, this is probably half of what I did. And the other half I didn't like. I did about at least three more of those that I threw away. And some other, and I redid three of these. In other words, the only one that's original from the first time around is this one. I did that one over, I did that one over, I did that one over. I'm not saying that to brag, I'm saying that because you get defeated sometimes. You know, you try an idea out, and you go with a hunch, and you get it further along, and you become your own critic. And that's important, to be your own critic and to step back and look at it and ask yourself some questions. And usually you don't see that right away. It's often the next day when you go in. Uh, there's a quote by uh, Stuart Davis, a painter. He said, I just want to do a painting that would make it through the night. <laughs> and I thought that was such a good idea, you know, because so often you don't make it through the night. You know, you thought it looked pretty good, you come back the next day and you go, oh, what was I thinking? Or, no, it isn't quite right yet. Um, and I look at these and I sometimes see things I wish I could change a little bit right now. Um, not too much, but a little bit. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, so how has your process changed over the years and in what ways do you feel like it's stayed the same? Um, well, I always loved drawing and uh, figured on I'd report cards from kindergarten that said something about my drawing. But um, if you wanted to find out how it's changed, you have to look at that blue book with my mixed media because it goes from abstract paintings to bronze casting to abstract sculpture, figurative sculpture, plastic pieces. And it often goes by decades. Sometimes a series will last only a couple months because it's a dead end. But a couple of them went on for 10 years. Um, work I did in the 80s. I did a big series of plague drawing related to the AIDS pandemic in the 90s. That was about a five year period and about 35 drawings. Um, so I think what stayed the same is that I always liked drawing and I keep coming back to the figure. To me, the figure is a metaphor a way of saying something about society. And artists who use the figure are either, in my opinion, formalist or humanist, or they switch back and forth. A formalist drawing the figure, it's a compositional device, it's a form, it's um, a nude. A humanist, the figure is naked. They're trying to say something about society and use the figure as a vehicle to make a comment that's outside the picture frame. And that's what these are. These are more of a humanist. Um, a formalist keeps the figure inside the picture frame, you might say. Uh, they don't, they're not trying to make references to something else. Um, anyhow, I don't know if that gets to your question. Um, any others at this time? Okay, um, I said something about, well, in my statement, I said on the wall over there that we are, I think, the only animal that converses about intangibles and uh, converse about things that are not physically present. And we use symbols to do that or metaphors to do that. And I also mentioned I wanted to talk about line a little bit. And a couple of years ago, when I was writing a figure drawing text, I was collecting um, comments, trying to 
find quotes by artists because I didn't want the figure drawing textbook to just to be what Clint Brown says about drawing. <clears throat> and I thought the best way to convince students was to have somebody like Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci say something. And um, <clears throat> I came across, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I came across the quote By Leonardo da Vinci, he said, a line has in itself neither matter nor substance and may rather be called an imaginary idea rather than a real object. A line is an imaginary idea. That stuck in my head and stayed with me for a long time. I kept thinking about that. What is a line? And another artist you've never heard of probably, but maybe you have, is Rico Lebrun. He did this drawing, and I always admired his drawings. And he said, true lines do not exist in nature. We invent them. They are poetic fiction. Now that sounds like something an artist would say, but for a scientist, line is a convenient fiction. It's what we use to codify information. In fact, remember this, line is our most useful invention of all times. It's the way we codify information and put information outside our body. It's the way we give language an afterlife, a permanence. And it's also what separated archaic humans from modern humans. We started codifying information. And we use it to put information in terms of letters, writing, numbers, blueprints, sheets of music, graphs. It's how we put information out there, including our text that we type in our little fingers on that telephone all the time. But anyhow, so in my opinion, line is our most useful invention. And, um, one that we use and one that distinguishes us as mark makers. We are tool makers. We often have heard that. Humans are tool makers. The Neanderthal was a tool maker. In fact, they know chimpanzees use stones to break up nuts and sticks to fish termites out of, out of their nests and so on. We are mark makers. That's what we are. And we use marks as drawings. I am particularly interested in that kind of mark making, but other kinds as well. And it's what distinguishes us. And it has also, it's how we ratcheted up the information we have, how we have evolved from the Ice Age when we first started using lines to create, create um, cave drawings and also lunar calendars by putting notches on a stick or a bone, 28 notches or 30 for a month of, before the next full moon. And what is interesting is it's the interval. And if I were to draw anybody in here, I would start with lines and I would probably be tracing features. But you know something? There's no lines around here. There's no black lines, but we still use them to put information together and to keep, to convey information. And anyhow, that's why I think it's what it is. Any questions at this point? Well, I think I pretty much summed up what I was going to say. Um, and, and I'd like, if you have no other questions, I'd like to invite you maybe to look at some of those books that are there. Oh, and one other thing. This is for you. Oh, thank you. And she gets the hard copy. The rest of you who want one can have a soft copy of Artist to Artist. 
is a book I put together after doing that figure drawing. I got a whole box of them here. Um, one second. And um, they're quotes by artists about various aspects of being an artist. No art critics, no art historian, no philosophers, just artists. What artists say about art. And different topics from creativity, light and shadow, uh, this being common, emotions, expression, drawing, line. I like I just came across. There are a few illustrations in here. This is a drawing by Degas. And I love what it says here, what he said, the dancer is only a pretext for a drawing. <laughs> and that's what these are. These were a pretext for doing drawing. Getting me out of my studio, let me play with the media, conjure up some new images. Um, one other point I'll make is that why you draw, why I draw, why anybody draws, I think is to perceive and to conceive. We draw to perceive, to get to know information, get to find out about things, to get to learn about things. And we also draw to conceive, to invent, to make things up. And as that word implies, we draw. Actually, the reason we use that word, it means we draw, we pull something across the surface, drawing a stick charcoal stick across the surface. But we also draw things out to get to know them, to make them visible, to expose them. We also draw things in to get to know it. We also ask other people or others to draw up their ideas. An architect doesn't draw the buildings that have already been built. He draws the buildings he wants to build. And that's the conjuring. So we draw to perceive it. Anyhow, if you want one of these, I'll do them. They're yours for the taking. There will be no test. Stop right away, right? Yes. from online for you. Um, a little late for the sound to end. Uh, your approach to drawing, how do they differ from when you draw from live models or from photos or through your imagination? Um, well, I don't often draw from photos, I would think, but I have drawn from live models. When you're drawing from a live model, you're basically approaching the model as a formalist. How do you place, you know, how do you place it on the space, on, on the page? How does it move across the space? Um, it's a compositional problem, and it's very hard to be a humanist in a drawing class and to be more expressive. You can try to do that. I've done that in a variety of ways. I asked students to be ex expressive as they could. One time, it almost got me into a little trouble. I was talking about Amnesty International, and it was, I think, when the Vietnam War was still on, and I was a young teacher. And in my figure drawing class, I asked a model, a male model, to wrap this rope around him while he was sitting in a chair, and I asked the students to try to make it as convincing as possible that this person is a prisoner. And then they did a good job, and I put the drawings up in, in the hall, and one of my colleagues said, you know, I don't know if I put those up. You don't have tenure. And they were afraid, you know, like somehow I was torturing the poor model and asking them to, I don't know, <laughs> be tied up physically. And actually it was a pretty, uh, they did a pretty good job of making it convincing drawings to be expressive. But it's hard to do that. It's hard to say, get your imagination into this and figure when you have a model there. And, I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to learn as much as you can at that time. Later, I try to apply. I don't know if that answers that question that was brought in. But I hope it does. We don't have a follow-up, so. 
What's that? No follow-up questions, so I think that might answer. Um, I have a question, though. Yeah. Could you talk about color a little bit? Most of your drawings are in black and white, but some of them, the ones on roofing paper in particular, are in color. Was there anything that informed that choice? or? Um, in, in those, I wanted each one to be a slightly different color. You know, using a uh, selection of a couple different crayons that would be dominant. Um, actually, I did a number of I did a number of pieces that were very colorful, and I didn't like them for this particular show. Um, I worked with some other media. Um, they didn't seem to turn out very well. They were maybe just a little too pretty and they didn't seem to work with the theme. But I have worked with a lot of color and media as, um, with paintings and acrylic, oil, other things, and even mixed media painted sculpture. So I have worked with color and I... Um, there's a follow-up question now. Isn't your ho aren't your homeless drawings from photos? Homeless drawings? Yes. No, um, there was actually two of them were based on real people. Um, so they're, they're talking about a series I did of homeless people here in that I had a show here in, in, at the Flyfish Gallery a couple years back. And one was a man walking with a jacket that said um, Dallas Cowboys on his back. Uh, it was like an athletic jacket. And I call that drawing once a cowboy band, but I didn't really draw it from him. I kind of remembered. I did some sketches when I was out and about, and there was a woman in a sleeping in the doorway. I didn't draw from her, but she had a, a bag on her heart that said Bed Bath and Beyond, and I thought that was pretty powerful, and I included that in the drawing. So in that sense, they kind of picked up on it, but the other ones were made up. Um, you know, more from keeping it as a memory. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, I bet these students won't have other things to do today. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Could you just mention really quickly, because um, I was telling them that Blackfish is a collective gallery. Yeah. Can you say anything about that, like just, just briefly? Okay, sure, yeah. Um, we are a uh, artist-owned and operated gallery. There are 30 members of us right now, about um, maybe 31. We usually try to keep it around 30. And <coughs> we all pay dues to help support the gallery. We also take turns mining the gallery. We also are often on committees, uh, help doing things, maintenance, uh, installing shows, taking shows down, and so on and so forth. Um, I think one advantage we have is because we're being supported by our membership, we can be a little bit edgier. You know, we're not thinking about what we can sell as one of the first criteria for showing <coughs> things. Um, we're always happy when something does sell, um, but it's not... Uh, not the necessary thing. And we do, besides showing our own members, um, we have invitational shows every July. We have a group show of students who are recently graduates from 14 schools throughout the state that offer an advanced degree in art. And uh, the schools pick two of their students to represent them, and then the students bring in their artwork. We don't choose the students or the art, but we put the exhibit together. Since the SDAs? Every July. Part of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, yeah, it's uh, um, a gallery people can join every now and then. We have somebody leaving and moving out of the area or just retiring. And then we have openings, and we have often, once a year, we review applicants who we want to join the gallery. We have a couple members here today. Um, I don't know what else they would add, but yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, um, that's about it, I think. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Are you continuing?
continuing this theme as a series, or are you um, moving probably on to something not. else? I'll move on to something else. I do, actually, I do have a, an offer to show this show at Newport, uh, their art center there. And I will probably do a few more pieces. It's a little bigger space than this, um, and see what happens. But after that, I think I will be ready to do something uh, something else. I'm not sure what that is, um, but something else. Maybe something more positive. <laughs> <laughs>